Hello, and welcome back to CS615 System Administration. This is week 6, segment 4, and with this video, we're continuing to illustrate different network protocols, briefly covering ICMP, the Internet Control Message Protocol. I'm sure you've all used ICMP, but it's useful to show how we can observe and analyze even trivial communications. We'll cover the two most commonly used ICMP applications, ping and trace route, as they help us answer at least some of the questions that had arisen in earlier videos. Now ping of course is about as trivial as a packet exchange can be, but let's quickly observe it in our host by capturing the IPv4 ICMP packets via TCP dump. And then, having the ping utility send just three echo requests over to www.yahoo.com. We then inspect the captured packets and see indeed just individual echo requests being sent by our host, with each triggering an echo reply from the web server on the remote end. We also see here that ICMP echo request echo reply packets can apparently have an identifier to make it easier to differentiate packets that belong together. But so perhaps there is a bit more to the packet format. So let's take a look at what the RFC tells us. As we see here, the packet is rather simple. We have a type, which is set to 0 for an echo reply and set to 8 for an echo request. A code field, which is all 0 for this type of message. We get a checksum, the identifier we just mentioned, and the sequence number for the message being ping-ponged between the hosts. But note that we also have a data section here, which perhaps is a bit weird and not something you may have used in the past. Let's see what the manual page says. Here, the dash p flag allows us to fill some data, which can be used to better identify and track packets when troubleshooting connections. But note that of course this can also be used in perhaps unanticipated ways. Many organizations prohibit egress traffic from their systems to the internet to, amongst other reasons, prevent data exfiltration. But ICMP messages are oftentimes permitted, since ICMP is rather useful and important for all sorts of troubleshooting. So you could encode the data and hide it in ICMP echo request packets. Like so. We encode the data into hex. And then let's capture the packet so we can observe the data being exfiltrated. Then send the ping packet with the extra data. So then when we read the captured packets, nothing looks particularly different. But if we ask for the full packets via the dash x flag, we notice that our packets now do contain the data as specified. While this is not a major concern in most cases, this is just another example of how understanding the different protocols across the stack is important, and that there's usually a little bit more to dig into than initially meets the eye. Anyway, so this is IPv4 ICMP echo request echo reply. What does this look like in the IPv6 world? Turns out it's really not all that different. Let's capture some ICMP v6 packets and repeat the same ping exercise from before. Here we go. And yep, all this looks almost identical. Source sends an echo request to the destination, the destination replies with an echo reply, and that's about it. Easy peasy. So regardless of which IP version we're using, the packets look the same. Echo request and echo reply. But here we go again, glossing over all that's going on in this silly internet cloud over here in the middle. How do we get the packet from our AWS instance over to Yahoo's web server? Remember a few videos back, we looked at the different AS numbers of the system to be determined from the traceroute we ran. We didn't go into the details of just how traceroute determined the path our packets are taking between two systems, but guess what? It involves ICMP. And what do we do when we want to know the details of the network communications? We go back to TCP dump. So here, 
we are on our EC2 instance ready to capture packets of type IPv4 that are either ICMP or UDP. We use the dash V flag to get a little bit of extra information about each packet. Then, over here on the right, we're running the traceroute command, asking it to only send a single probe to make it easier for us to inspect the packets. When we run this command, we immediately see the captured packets here on the left. So let's scroll back up to see just how traceroute works. The first packets we see up here are the DNS lookup for www.yahoo.com, which we've seen before. Then below, we see our IP address 10.10.0.47 sending a UDP packet to port 33435 with a TTL of 1. We then see that we get back a packet from 216, 182, 238, 127 of type ICMP time exceeded in transit. This is because every router will decrement the TTL, and if the TTL reaches zero, it will generate this ICMP time exceeded message. So we in effect trick the first hop to reply to us by setting a TTL of 1, knowing that the next hop must necessarily generate this message, and we thereby learn its IP address. We then repeat the same process with a TTL set to 2, thereby allowing the first hop to pass the packet onto the next hop which then will generate the time exceeded message. Then we repeat again with a TTL set to 3, to then again have the first two hops pass it on, and the third to trigger the ICMP message. and so on, and so on. Finally, at the last hop, we're setting a TTL of 16 now. Which reaches the destination. But the destination won't generate a time exceeded message, and there is no, you have reached your destination, ICMP type. So how do we know we have reached the destination? Well, look at the packet here. It says destination port unreachable. That is, we again trick the system in sending us a message by picking this random UDP port here. Which of course means that if the host was listening on that port, we wouldn't be getting a response. So we're once again really just being opportunistic. All right, so that's trace route in IPv4. Now for IPv6, we want to avoid capturing some of the other ICMP noise we've seen, neighbor discovery or router solicitation in IPv6 also happen over ICMP. So we restrict our capture to only echo request and echo reply types. Okay, let's run our trace route over IPv6. Now scroll back up, and here we go. Looks familiar, right? In IPv6, the TTL is called the hop limit. So here we set the hlim to 1. And the first router returning the time exceeded message. The second message with an hlim set to 2 returned the second hop. and so on and so on. Until down here, we again get the same destination unreachable message when we hit the destination host. To visualize how we tricked each router to tell us its IP address along the way to the destination, we send a packet with the hlim set to 1. 
The router decrements the hlim, then checks if the hlim is zero. If so, it returns the time exceeded message, and we can record our first hop. Then we send a new packet with an hlim of 2, our first router decrements the hlim to 1 and forwards it, the second router decrements the hlim, finds it to be 0, and generates the time exceeded message, and we have our second hop. Once more, now with hlim equals 3, which gets forwarded, and forwarded, but then hit the limit, and we generate the exceeded message, and we have our third hop. On our last packet, we repeat the same process until we hit the destination, which hopefully is not listening on anything on the random UDP port we had picked, and it will then generate the destination unreachable message, letting us know that we fit our target. Ok, time for our quick summary. We've seen some use of ICMP, most notably the ubiquitous echo request echo reply messages sent using ping. We've also seen the use of traceroute, which uses a random UDP port, destination, and then sends packets with an increasing TTL, tricking the routers along the way to send back ICMP time exceeded messages. Until our destination tells us that the port we're trying to talk to cannot be reached. Now, since it's possible that something along the way blocks UDP, for example, you can also use ICMP or TCP packets to send to the destination. One thing we haven't discussed is the IPv4 path MTU discovery. This is used to determine the maximum packet size that will make it to the destination without fragmentation. Look up why that would be useful and just how exactly it works. You should find that it works very similarly to traceroute. But ICMP is not just restricted to these use cases. There are several other types. Go find out what they are and when you might want to use them. It will soon help you understand why it's generally a bad idea to block ICMP across the board. When you run your trace routes to different locations on the internet, you will likely encounter several that either include asterisks in the middle or that time out and do not reach the destination. Think about under what circumstances that happens. Finally, recall that we can look up the AS numbers of the networks along the way. When you trace route a system from AWS, you may find several that are listed as being in AS0. What's up with that? Look at the IP allocations for this AS and try to find an explanation for why we are seeing these here. With all that, I hope you've gained a bit of an understanding of the Internet Control Message Protocol and expanded your horizon beyond just UDP and TCP. These latter two we've already seen in an earlier video, and we'll again observe them in future videos when we talk about different application layer protocols. Until then, thanks for watching. Cheers.